my inflation rate. Now, admittedly, this is kind of a peculiar title for an economics talk, especially one about a common statistic reported by the government. After all, if we're talking about the inflation rate, it's just one number. So why bother talk about my inflation rate? As this sounds a little bit silly. Well, think about it in terms of conversations that you may have heard among friends and colleagues when they talk about inflation. It's not uncommon to hear people say something like this. I don't care what the government says is the official, you know, inflation rate. I'm pretty sure it's much higher than that. Now, admittedly, maybe we don't go to the same cocktail parties or share the same friends, but I think you get my point. People have a natural suspicion or gut instinct that the inflation rate that's reported seems to be different than their own personal experience. And in this video, is designed to underscore the point that that intuition is right on target. However, it doesn't mean that what the government is reporting is inaccurate or even unworthy of our attention. We don't want to go down that cynical path as we'll be throwing away important information. The folks at the Bureau of Labor Statistics who are responsible for calculating it do very good work and they've even made revisions in their methodology based on constructive criticism that they've received over the years, both from business leaders and from the general public. Now, it is true that in the early days of constructing the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which of course is the statistic that is used to measure inflation, that it was constructed in a rather rudimentary way. In a nutshell, it worked like this. The government would use what it called a typical market basket of goods of a typical consumer that they would consume and simply add up all the things in that market basket. Then the next month, it would look at that same basket of goods and do the same thing. So if the cost of that same basket of goods went up, you have inflation, and in the unlikely event that it went down, you have deflation, which actually has happened a couple of times. Now at this point, you're probably already seeing some problems, even though it looks like the most logical way of going about it. After all, what you want to do is make sure that you're comparing apples with apples. And that's the reason why you have this market basket. The first problem that you're probably noted already is what is the business about this typical market basket of goods? You might be asking yourself, what if my basket is not the same as the basket that's being used to measure the CPI? And if you're asking these questions, you're on the right track. Also, you might be wondering, what would happen if that same basket of goods is no longer really consumed? That is, what happens if people actually change their behavior? All of these nagging questions are now starting to shed some doubt on using the CPI as a measure of inflation, or at least as a measure of cost of living, right? Well, let's do a little thought experiment. Let's suppose that the manager of a local grocery store wants to show that his grocery store is cheaper, and maybe he's quite confident, uh, quite confident that that's true and it's cheaper than the competition. So he does something very clever. He announces on a particular Saturday morning, that the 101st customer that walks into the store will get a $500 spending spree. Uh, the only condition is the person has to spend all of the money or at least get to within a dollar of spending at all. But wait, it gets better. Now he tells you that he's going to allow you to shop at his competitor's store, but you have to buy exactly the same items that you bought the first time. When you are done, he'll come over and pay for the groceries, even if it's more expensive. Now, suppose that it is more expensive. Suppose the final cash register receipt shows it totaling $525, which is $25 more expensive than you shop for in the first store. Does this necessarily mean that the first store is cheaper? Well, the answer is not necessarily. Now, as fair as this contest appears to be, the customer is really not behaving the same way in both stores. In the first store, the customer is responding to relative prices, that is, buying more of those products that are relatively cheaper, economizing on products that are more expensive. However, when the customer walks into the second store, all bets are off. He's not able to respond to relative prices. He must buy exactly the same goods in exactly the same quantities. And that means that even if some of these products are more expensive, he can't buy less. And even if some are cheaper, he can't buy more. Well, that is exactly what the problem is with the original construction of the CPI. But using the same critique today is a bit unfair because the good folks at the BLS are not naive. <laughs> they too recognize those problems, and now they publish an alternative to the CPI known as the chain-weighted CPI. This statistic actually considers changes to consumer spending patterns to provide a little bit more of an accurate picture. 
of the cost of living based on the goods that consumers actually consume. Now, admittedly, it's with a lag. Now, it hasn't eliminated all the problems with the CPI, and unfortunately, this is not the statistic that is reported in the media. So if you need to get this number, you'll need to visit bls.gov and check it out for yourself. But more importantly, what you really need, or what you really should be doing, is looking at the things that you actually spend in your own budget and take stock of things for yourself. This is particularly important, let's say, for example, if your behavior is very much different, um, let's say in the case of uh, you being a retired person, right? Well, are you still using a landline? <laughs> are you still subscribing to expensive cable TV instead of cheaper options of subscribing to streaming services? Now, of course, on the other hand, recently researchers uh, have suggested that retired persons actually have more time to spend, to shop for bargains, allowing them to pay lower prices for some of the same quality and quantity of goods. In fact, the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Dallas has actually demonstrated that over the life cycle, people's shopping time actually increases, and prices they pay may actually decrease. And certainly around retirement, uh, the prices people pay for goods can drop significantly. Now, this isn't because retired people like eat less. It's because they tend to be more frugal. They tend to prepare more home-cooked meals. They eat out less. The upshot of this is that you need to calculate your own inflation rate, whether you're a retired person, a college student, or the head of a, a household with you know, four children in it, and take a look at your own personal spending patterns. Then and only then will you have a better idea of what your own cost of living truly is. And then, and only then, can you take appropriate measures to help shield yourself from the ravages of inflation, which will be the topic in my next video. Until next time, take care and best wishes.